a key theme that I see running through our scripture readings this morning is one of the core values of our parish, Christ Church Rica. And it's also one of the core and foundational values of our country. And that is the value of hospitality. Hospitality. In the gospel, Jesus sends out 70 of his disciples as lambs in the midst of wolves, completely vulnerable and fully dependent upon the hospitality of others. Jesus says to them, if people welcome you and treat you with hospitality, then bless them with my peace and let them know the kingdom of God is near. But if people fail to welcome you, and if people fail to show you hospitality, then shake the dust off your feet and don't look back. Don't waste your time with them. Because when you're out there, you're representing me. And if they reject you, they are rejecting me. In his letter to the Galatians, the Apostle Paul is arguing in favor of hospitality to the Gentiles. Paul's audience, the Galatians, were actually descendants of pagan Celts living in Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. So the Galatians, where you get the term Gaul and Gaelic, were actually Celtic Christians before Celtic Christianity was a thing. Hundreds of years before St. Patrick and St. Columba and all those Celtic saints I love to talk about. These were the original Celtic Christians, and these original Celtic Christians were being told by Jewish Christians that they needed to be circumcised in order to be true followers of Christ. And Paul says, that's hogwash. Paul refuses to make circumcision an obstacle for people entering the church. For the Gentiles, Paul demonstrates and upholds a generous and radical hospitality at the risk of severe criticism and even rejection from other Christian leaders. The other apostles were not too fond of this idea initially. It's partly because, or even mostly because, of Paul's risky and inspired and holy hospitality to the Gentiles that the Christian church has been able to survive, and in many cases thrive, for almost 2,000 years now. If Paul did not uphold and practice this hospitality, most of us here would not be Christian, unless we were already Jewish. We are indebted to Paul and his hospitality to the Gentiles. And today, we have an opportunity to express our gratitude to the church and to Paul. We have the privilege and opportunity to extend hospitality and warmth and loving welcome to someone who will soon become the world's newest baptized Christian, young Cameron Jean Bazzoli, whom we will be praying for and whom we will baptize in a few moments, whom we will wash in the holy waters of the spiritual river Jordan, whose name will be written in heaven. So this leads me to our reading from the Hebrew scriptures about a Syrian king named Naaman, or Bob pronounced it very well. The original Hebrew is more like Naaman, Naaman, but I'm going to say Naaman. King Naaman reluctantly dunked himself in the Jordan River to be healed of his leprosy. And this was thanks to the advice of a young Hebrew girl in his camp. And I don't know if you were following this story, but I'll admit that this story puts kind of a different spin on the theme of hospitality. Because King Naaman expected this somewhat backwater prophet Elisha to 
lavish him with praises, and then conjure the power of his God in performing a shamanic healing ritual over his leprous skin, thus enacting a dramatic and magnificent cure. Instead, the prophet Elisha does not even give Naaman the courtesy of greeting him at the door. Instead, Elisha sends a messenger to tell Naaman to wash seven times in the Jordan, which is actually a fairly muddy river in comparison to the beautiful rivers of Naaman's home in Syria. And this scripture reading reminds me of a story from the tradition of the desert fathers and mothers of the 5th and 6th century in Egypt and Palestine. There's a story of this great and renowned Archbishop Theophilus who goes into the desert of Egypt to visit and seek wisdom from one of the desert fathers whose name was Abba Pombo. When the Archbishop arrives, Abba Pombo remains completely silent. And so Abba Pombo's disciples gather around and say, Abba, please offer a word of wisdom to edify the Archbishop. Abba Pombo says, If he is not edified by my silence, how will he be edified by my speech? If he is not edified by my silence, how will he be edified by my speech? So like the prophet Elisha, Abba Pombo offers a very peculiar form of hospitality, a very peculiar form of teaching or pastoral care that would probably not be too popular in the Episcopal Church. But according to Scripture and according to the Christian tradition, there are many cases in which prestigious people of wealth and power and high status actually receive a serious lack of hospitality from their host. At least they appear to receive a lack of hospitality. And this seems to be a very good thing. Because in this way, the hosts are serving them a most generous slice of humble pie. King Naaman eventually decided to eat his slice of humble pie by wading into the water of that muddy river Jordan, where he then experienced healing and newness of life. The text says at the end, his flesh was restored like the flesh of a young boy, and he was made clean. And we Christians have understood this story clearly as a foreshadowing of holy baptism, a sacrament in which we call on the Holy Spirit to sanctify the water of that font and give it the same healing properties of the Jordan River, making it into a well of everlasting life through which we are all made clean. That's why I love to asperge you all with this holy water. It has healing properties through which we are all made clean, through which we can all become healthy and vivacious children of God. Jesus said, unless you become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of God. This is Jesus' way of saying, all are welcome, but some may need to eat some humble pie before they're ready. I'm sure we can think of many prestigious and powerful people today who can use a dose, a healthy dose, of humility. A few days ago, we celebrated the birthday of our country, which just turned 243 years old. I believe one reason why our country has been able to survive and in many ways thrive for over two centuries and hopefully will continue to survive and thrive is because it was, a, it was founded upon the core values of equality and liberty and justice and hospitality. That is why I proudly display our flag and I'm happy to see you all displaying your 4th of July colors. Those are pointing to those core values of equality, liberty, justice, and hospitality. 
If our founding fathers and their descendants failed to uphold and practice this biblical and Christian value of hospitality, then most of us, perhaps all of us, would not be here today. I'm guessing all of us would not be here today, unless some of us are Native American. Just as we Christians are indebted to the Apostle Paul's hospitality for our full inclusion in the church, so too are we citizens indebted to our country's hospitality for our full inclusion in this nation. We have reason to give thanks. Personally, if my Russian Jewish ancestors remained in their homeland, they would have been killed either as a result of the pogroms and late 19th and early 20th century, or as a result of World War II. I know this because after World War II, all the Jews of my great-grandfather's village were completely wiped out. So I thank God that the United States showed them hospitality when they needed it. And I also thank God for the prophetic voices of citizens and activists who often had to serve our elected officials several slices of humble pie, or maybe several full pies, by reminding them of our nation's core values, especially the value of hospitality. I am particularly thankful for one prophetic young woman, a young Jewish-American woman who advocated for my family and my ancestors and for other Jews escaping anti-Semitic violence in Russia, and who helped my family settle into a new and safe and healthy life here in the United States. This prophetic woman was named Emma Lazarus. Emma Lazarus. She was an activist and a prophet. And most of us know her as a poet. Because she used her poetic gifts to remind our nation to uphold and practice generous hospitality, especially in her most popular and moving poem titled The New Colossus, which is written upon a bronze plaque inside the Statue of Liberty. And just this last week, our presiding bishop, the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, Michael Curry, referenced this poem in his address to the clergy of this diocese. And also this last week, the seven bishops of the state of California. There are now three male bishops and four female bishops, including our newly consecrated Bishop Megan Truckware. These seven bishops of the state of California, of the six dioceses of California, wrote a prophetic statement. They've issued it, and it's part of our chronicle, and it's part of my responsibility as your priest, to share this with you, because they are our pastors. The bishops are our pastors. Their prophetic statement is reminding us, as a nation, to uphold and practice hospitality. Specifically, to children. And specifically, to children at our borders. And it does not matter if we're Republicans or Democrats Trump supporters or liberal leftists or anything in between. As long as we are baptized Christians, it is our duty to pray for and to try to help any child who is in need. It is part of, our, part of fulfilling our baptismal vows, which we will renew again today, to strive for peace and justice among all people and to respect the dignity of every human being, especially children who are filling this sanctuary with their beautiful voices this morning. I'm so thankful for that. (laughs) It is also our duty as citizens of this great nation to uphold the core values of our founding fathers, especially the core value of hospitality. So, My brothers and sisters in Christ, let us pray for all children. Remembering that beautiful song that I learned in Sunday school growing up, that Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, for they are precious in his sight. And let us prayerfully and joyfully welcome in 
to the body of Christ Church Rica, a most beautiful child named Cameron Jean Zoli, who will soon become the world's newest Christian after we pour upon her the healing waters of the River Jordan. And as we continue to uphold and practice hospitality, perhaps with a slice of humble pie, let us also continue to give thanks for our church and for our country. As we hear the powerful words of Emma Lazarus's prophetic poem, The New Colossus. Not like the brazen giant of Greek fame, with conquering limbs astride from land to land. Here at our sea-washed sunset gates shall stand a mighty woman with a torch whose flame is the imprisoned lightning and her name, Mother of Exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome. Her mild eyes command the air-bridged harbor that twin cities frame. Keep ancient lands your storied pomp, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. <laughs> 